When fall time hits in the Pacific Northwest, there are two guarantees in life. The first one is that it's definitely gonna rain, and the second one is you're gonna want some lights to go night riding with. Here at Fanatic, outbound lights are our go-to choice for night riding. I'm gonna get out on the trail and see what these lights are all about. Lucky for us, some of Outbound's engineering team actually lives in town too, and we're gonna sit down with them to see what makes Outbound lights so special. So let's get out on the trail and do some night riding. Yeehaw. We are out on the trail, finally night riding. Currently got the trail Evo up front on the handlebars and the hangover on the head. I do like how compact they are. All right, twisty turny, high speed. This is one where you're definitely looking through the corners with your helmet light. We can tell Dash how good an Oriental was tomorrow. Yeah. Oh yeah. All right, so we are back in the garage after doing some night riding and I can definitely see why a good set of lights makes all the difference and makes for a more enjoyable experience. These outbound lights, the user interface is super easy. It's just one button to turn this thing on and off, cycle through the modes easy to tell what your battery life is at with just little LED indicators. Uh, the mounts on these things are great. Really impressed with this handlebar mount. Doesn't rattle, so the light always stays nice and solid, and it's got this sweet quick release. Makes it easy to get these things on and off. So, got the lights off the bike, gonna get them on the charger, get them ready for the next time. I'm gonna go out and do some night riding, and in the meantime, we will go chat with the outbound team and see what makes these lights so special. All right, so I have finally gotten out, rode with these outbound lights. You know, my history of riding, night riding, I was used to using a lot of handlebar lights with external batteries you had to strap to the bike and things like that. Oh. Outbound, not like that. Self-contained lights, it's great. Lucky for us, you, Tom, live here in Bellingham. You're part of the outbound team. Yeah. So maybe introduce yourself and uh, give us a little backstory on outbound. I'm Tom, I'm one of the owners of Outbound. My partner Matt founded the company seven, eight years ago now. And then after two years or so, I came on and it was just the two of us for a while designing and doing everything. He was building lights in his apartment. Then we got some warehouse space, have kind of grown and grown, and now we're up to nine people. Okay. We've got a uh, Pacific Northwest headquarters, uh, which is <laughs> yeah. here. Science here, secret? No. Okay. <laughs> no. The rest of our electronics lab space, we've got a lot of you know, this would be uh, support parts and, you know, boards from production that had rework issues. When we're developing Portal, we're going through a bunch of different shell designs and battery tray designs. Competitive analysis, tearing down other companies' lights to see what they do well and what they don't do well. Axis batteries, also pretty fun. All the cut-up optics to make the Super Evo Boost Plus LT over there. And we're hand-building boards a lot, so we've got, like, solder stencils so that we can actually um, put precise amounts of solder on the tiny circuit components and then build these prototypes by hand. Neutral charging station, we use this for 24 hour races and things so we can charge a ton of lights all at the same time. Right behind you, we've got our runtime tester version two that Chase is working on so we can get multiple lux meters and measure what the board thinks it's doing, what light is actually coming out over time and then plot it so we can see if we're getting the performance we think we're getting. Parts, shit. <laughs> we're building boards. We've got all these tiny little components in these trays so we can keep them all straight and then hand place them with tweezers for prototype builds. This is also why you don't wear Crocs in the electronics lab. Um, don't want to. <laughs> just don't touch anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we're just 3D printing all these trays so that we can organize this a little more cleanly. Thank yeah. you, Chase. Yeah, Chase is the other outbound light employee here in Bellingham. Chase is our senior electrical engineer. Um, senior and junior. <laughs> <laughs> only electrical engineer, yeah. 
We've got nine people total, a couple engineers, full-time production automation engineer who's just designing equipment to help assemble lights faster, more efficiently, more accurately, and then a couple assemblers building lights in Chicago. Sweet, yeah, so Chicago is where most of the team is based. We get parts from all over. You know, we get our electronics are done in Arizona. We've got hard parts molded in Michigan, and then we assemble everything in Chicago. So we're okay. as made in America as we can be for an electronic device. Yeah, Chicago, I don't necessarily think of like a mountain biking uh, capital. Um, Not so much. Which is why you're here, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and this is where yeah. we do all of our R&D and testing. Control run. And it's gone. It gets wet, it gets heat, it gets very dark. This yep. is the place. Yep, and you've got three main mountain bike kind of uh, light. You do have a fourth one, the detour, which is more of your road light. Yeah. Maybe run us through what lights we got in the lineup. Sure, uh, we've got our Hangover, which was our first self-contained mountain bike light. The lightest, smallest, least expensive, also optimized for helmet use. We have our Evo, which is the big bad mamma jamma that goes on the bars. Super wide, even beam. We've got some cable management accessories and things. And then Portal, and Portal kind of slots in between. Depending on use cases, it's a little bit more power, more battery than Hangover. It's a little lighter and less power than Evo. In the middle on price and can be used as a really high performance helmet light for super steep, gnarly shoots that we have a lot of around here. Or it could be a lighter weight, like gravel light on the bars, okay. cross country light. And we have a swappable mount interface on this guy so that you can switch it from a standard GoPro style helmet mount to our quick release handlebar mount just to make that nice and easy. A lot of these other brands are out there and they, they're always talking about lumens and that's like a big one. You guys, I noticed, don't really talk about that necessarily as a selling point. So yeah, what makes a good mountain bike light? Lumens is not the most important thing. Lumens is basically a measurement of how much light total you're getting out of the product, not where it's going, what color it is, anything like that. So lumens matter, but we're not chasing a 10,000 lumen light because it doesn't actually feel five times as bright. Your eyes don't respond linearly to light output because your pupils adjust to okay. that. So we're basically trying to make lights that actually work really well out in the field that aren't just bright on paper. So the big the big lumens number, you know, it's really just a marketing tagline. <laughs> it <laughs> to matters. Some extent, it it matters. matters in the same way that uh, suspension matters. Yeah. You know, you you want some suspension travel. Having 20 inches of travel <laughs> probably doesn't make it better, right? Yeah. So the two things I would say are beam pattern and then optimizing it for the specific use case. We'll get into the beam pattern in a bit, but just in terms of optimizing something for bike use, you know, rather than just taking a typical like flashlight style product yep. and strapping it to the bars, we're making special mounts that are designed specifically for modern handlebars with quick release interfaces so you can yeah. easily pop them on and off without having to have special tools. Being able to integrate with helmet mounts that are standardized. You know, a lot of helmets have uh, integrated mount interfaces now. We make sure that it works with that. But then things like, you know, ergonomics and user interface, you know, being able to pick up the light and know you've got enough battery left to get through a ride yeah. and not guess. Knowing what mode you're in at all times, not having to cycle through a bunch of like SOS and strobe modes that you're never gonna use on the trail. Yeah. Being able to feel the button through cold winter gloves, because most of the time you're riding at night, it's gonna be cold and dark outside because it's in winter but then also not being able to accidentally turn it on like you toss in a gear bag or something. So designing our lights so that you can't easily accidentally turn them on, uh -huh. but you can pretty easily with a single finger turn on the lights. And like, yeah, you've got a bunch of 3D printed stuff here. You're doing a lot of that like rapid prototyping kind of here. Yeah, you know, I would say as a company ethos, we try to design products for the, the majority of customers first mm -hmm. and then add features and, and things on top of that to kind of narrow the use case so that we have the best, simplest product for the most people. Then we can start adding things to make those situations work. Yeah, so that's like a big part of like the customer service aspect of Outbound. Like you guys yeah. really prioritize that. Like working with a customer, they call in with something, you can come up with these kind of mounts. Yeah, um, I mean, if you call, you'll probably get voicemail because there's <laughs> not that many of us. We don't yeah. have somebody sitting by the phone, but we will get yeah. back to you. Yeah. We get all kinds of weird requests from people and I say weird just because we don't have a standard solution for it, but I hate saying, sorry, there's not an answer to that. Yeah. We can figure something out. So we spend a lot of time just printing and trying stuff uh, that is functional prototypes. You know, this is 3D printed, but it's plenty strong to put on the bike and yeah. rally downhill and survive. 
So from a customer support standpoint, it's not just about you know warranty coverage, which is also very important for us, but it's just making sure people get the right setup from the start so that yeah. they're happy and everything works really reliably. I will admit, I kind of just threw the lights on my stuff and didn't read any manuals, didn't, didn't do anything. So maybe like run us through what are the, the settings and the modes on these lights? Well, first of all, you're not alone. <laughs> um, most people don't read uh, yes. instructions or otherwise. So um, all of our mountain bike lights right now have a very simple user interface. We have four indicator LEDs on the top. We turn it on, it always turns on an adaptive mode and then high, medium, low, and back around. So the first mode comes on an adaptive, which is gonna give you the most light for the longest period of time, meaning it starts at max brightness. Uh -huh. And then it'll slowly taper over the first 20 minutes or so based on battery, temperature, runtime, and then flatten off around 70%. And the idea uh -huh. is that your eyes are adapting to darkness. Your pupils are dilating, letting more light in. So you don't feel that change in brightness, but you get more runtime as a result. So yeah, what is kind of typical runtime on these lights? Obviously they're all different sizes, so they're gonna have different batteries. Yeah, um, there's a little bit of difference between them in general. On max output, you'll be getting around an hour and a half. Medium will give you three to four hours. You can easily get two hours in adaptive mode, just yeah. turn it on and go, not have to think about it. Honestly, on a lot of these enduro style rides, the climbing is what takes the longest, right? Yeah. So you put it on low for that. You can easily get four hours and then have full blast for every downhill. I don't know that I want to be out there for four hours. I think my mind would kind of start wandering, think like, you know, big kitty cats following me, something like that. Be out here riding by yourself and you can't help but think a creepy clown or something's gonna pop out of the, the bushes. I guess I'd rather it be like a creepy clown than some glowing eyes in the bushes that turn out to be like a kitty cat. Let's get into kind of the sciencey stuff like we were talking lumens versus, you know, beam patterns, optics, all that good stuff. All right, so we, we talk about lumens. Lumens is just how much light is coming out of the device total. Lux is a measure of intensity. You can have 10,000 lumens and only have five lux on this gigantic wall. Or you can have a thousand lux right in the middle and you, all you can see is this one really bright spot. Neither of those are ideal for bike riding. What we're doing is we're designing our optics in-house. We're doing a lot of simulation to verify that we're getting the beam pattern and distribution we want for each individual product. Hangover being our helmet light, it's mounted on your head. So it's pointed where you're looking all the time. That means we can use a narrower beam. We can have a very gentle fall off to the periphery. So there's no harsh edges. There's no like circle. And then everything outside of it is black. And then for the bars, because it's mounted on your bike, it's never quite pointed exactly where you're looking. We want the beam to be super wide and even so that you never lose the trail. And if you just have this little tunnel of light, it's really easy to lose your line. It's really easy to get unbalanced. So now you've got your helmet light and your bar light designed to blend together. Also on the trail, you get a lot more depth from your handlebar light than you uh -huh. do for your helmet light. And this goes for any helmet light. Anything that's above your eye line is now projecting light down behind objects that you're looking at. Here's a perfect example of why having both lights is important. Here with just a helmet light above my eye line, this section of trail looks really flat. But if I move that same light down to the bars, all of a sudden this hole appears because I'm projecting shadows out that I can look down into. That's why it's important to have both lights so that I can get the depth from the bar light and be able to see into holes and features with the helmet light. And you could try this yourself. Just take your light and move it down and see how different a trail looks. Where do you kind of see it going in the future with batteries getting smaller? And... I see a lot of um, safety and packaging improvements coming in batteries, yeah. like sodium cells that are safer. So if you get a, you know, you crash and you puncture the light with something metal, it won't catch fire and yeah. explode. Saying safety, I think that's one thing people could go on Amazon and buy some cheap like knockoff light. They can. But they could also burn their house down. <laughs> I, have, I, I have literally witnessed somebody pulling a steaming battery pack out of their Camelback. Uh, in the middle of a ride and they threw it in the dumpster and left it there. <laughs> oh, oh boy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not great. And yeah. I've, you know, I used to uh, work in a lab where I took apart a ton of garbage. You know, a four cell battery pack and two of the cells are completely dead. So they're not even wired in. They're just oh physically in the pack to make it heavy. I've seen cells that were filled with sand. It was just the mechanical shell. You know, the soldering practices are all janky. You get cold solder joints that spark and fail. There is something to paying a bit more for electronics yeah. manufacturing. For yeah. sure. how, does, how does warranty and rider support kind of look? On yeah, your guys then. we cover basically everything. Um, you know, we have a, a limited warranty, a uh, three-year warranty, and that's for everything, batteries, defects, etc. 
also covers crash damage and user error and dogs eating your lights and all <laughs> kinds of dumb stuff. We just want people to not be dicks about it. So we have a don't be a dick warranty extension policy. If you're nice to us and you have a light that's six years old and it needs repair, just tell us and yeah. we'll take care of you. You know, we're about to have a new office here in town. So we'll have a place where customers can just swing by if they need spare parts, uh, support, and then um, retail, they can come by yeah. Fanatic. So you guys are like able to, you're opening these lights up and like soldering new things in there if needed. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, we'd much prefer to repair if we can for two reasons. One, we don't want to throw away perfectly good stuff. You know, the electronics are the most expensive part of the light. Mm -hmm. If somebody crashes and they break the shell or the mount or something, we can usually salvage the majority of the cost of the light and keep a bunch of electronics out of the landfill. But then second, we can also see how something fails. Customer will be like, I don't know, it just broke. That's fine, but I want to see it so I can understand if it's going to happen again. Or is this somebody hooked a little too hard into a tree and broke something, you know? That kind of damage happens. I just want to be able to react to it quickly so I can design a better product, basically. Yeah, I mean. I see your car in the trailheads all the time, mm -hmm. and I know it's, oh, it's night riding season, <laughs> Tom's out, you know? So, That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, sweet, Tom, uh, really appreciate it. This has been great. Cool to see the behind the scenes, see a bunch of Nerd crazy, stuff. yeah, nerdy engineering <laughs> things that I'll never understand. So, sweet, appreciate it, man. Yeah. So it was great to sit down with Tom and chat with him to see what makes Outbound Lights so special. I am going to have to pick up a set of these lights myself because they really do make night riding a more enjoyable experience. If you're looking for a set of Outbound Lights, you can find them at fanaticbike.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe, share this video with your friends, and we'll see you next time.